Hello, and welcome everyone back to another episode of the Publisher Lab. And joined alongside me is someone who, in each podcast now, for those that watch, will notice that she seems to be in a different location. And um, today is no different. Welcome back, Whitney Wright. Thank you. Yes, I am back to um, my former location. I've been in this location a couple of times, but last week I was just mentioning that I was house sitting for my sister. And so I had her whole house to myself, which was nice. And they just updated their kitchen and stuff. So I was looking back at the video. I was like, it kind of looks like one of those fake um, screens <laughs> like the, behind me. Yeah. Like the, the green screens that you can do on like yeah. a Google meet or something. Yeah. yeah. But then, but then the dog comes up to me and I like, I start petting it and like nothing glitches. So I'm like, it's real. <laughs> well, but it, it does I mean, like for a fake background for now it's real. I mean, I imagine you'll be able to pet virtual dogs in your Google meet background here in the near future. Probably. Um, I'll They're be probably disappointed if, if that's not the case, to be honest. Someone at Google listening, get on that. It's a great product idea. Meetings. <laughs> um, Snapchat's going to take of, it from you. Snapchat. <laughs> yeah, Snapchat. Um, have you just, I feel like I've seen a lot of news about Google Analytics 4. What's, do you know what's going on with it? I know that there's like some people that are using it, some people that aren't. There's been like some issues with like some data transferring. Well, I'll speak to our publishers that are listening because I'm, I'm guessing that most of them um, are, ha have had to at least do something related to it because it, it's they're depreciating the previous version of uh, Google Analytics, um, and they've been depreciating different tags and things like that over the years. And every time they do, it's a, it's a big pain in the butt for publishers because Google Analytics is sort of like it's um it's become almost a requisite. People put it on their sites. You don't you don't have to use it. It it's actually funny now. There are enough other like ways of tracking pretty much everything that are kind of better in a lot of ways. But Google Analytics is just a full suite get all the data that you can possibly get tool that everybody uses. So um, changing is always kind of a pain. And change is never something that people love outright, especially like an interface and different things like that. But Google, I will say, all of our publishers, I'm guessing I'm not alone in saying that we probably all have like beefs with what's been done. Um, my biggest one is that they've changed terminologies and also classifications and the way that they, and even the syntax. So something that used to mean one thing or used to be called something else, like, uh, you know, referral path URL or something like that. It's like now it has a different name that, you know, and referral path means something different. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's a very, it's a very frustrating thing because it just felt unnecessary in a lot of ways. Um, changing the tags makes sense because there's the way that browsers and, and things like that get updated. It, it makes sense. But when they make a product change like this or an update, um, it was like, who's it for? You know, because I've only heard pretty much people kind of lament the changes. So um, mm -hmm. I've played with it quite a bit and I, I still don't really see it as an upgrade and kind of find it to be a little bit um, yeah, annoying in different ways because I think they try to dumb down things that aren't worth trying to dumb down and then just make it yeah. like, worse for everybody. So yeah, yeah, that's my rant on Google GA4 and <laughs> uh, or GA4 and hopefully our, our audience can find that endearing. And if you love it, hey, great, because we're yeah. all stuck with it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I toyed around with it a little bit and I was struggling to figure out what it is I needed to do to get what I want. But um, that's one of my goals today is to kind of look at it a little bit closer. I was trying to find a certain blog that we had posted and look at its analytics and I was just struggling. But um, the other thing that I've seen, um, and these are not our topics, it's just things I've seen, um, is that like apparently there's like a lot of ranking volatility right now and like people are like, is there a Google algorithm update? I don't know if you've seen anything, any news on that, but there's like just people kind of wondering what's going on at Google, but they haven't really announced anything. Speaking of my rants, I mean, I, I, I'll save everybody <laughs> because I, I've, you, you can go back and listen to some of the past SC, uh, the episodes where I've talked about SEO and how it actually works from both inside knowledge at Google and then just also mm -hmm. um, over a decade of sort of like working on these types of things. So whether or not there's an algorithm update probably isn't all that important because right. it, it, it's more important of whether or not you're affected by something that Google has changed. And my guess is they're probably changing a lot right now. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, their emphasis right now seems to be strongly on finding ways to incorporate AI into sort of saving the future of the, their business um, and incorporating 
uh, like Bard and things like that into search and making, mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out like w how is user behavior going to change over the next three or four years? While technologies and trends can come and go pretty quickly, as we've seen with the AI, user behavior is like way more of a longer tail. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's more gradual. So I think there's a, a inclination that, that businesses have to kind of feel like this things aren't really changing, so we don't have to do anything. And I think Google's hyper aware of that. Um, so I would expect the volatility to continue, although mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect like an outright choking of all your traffic because Google, you know, completely, you know, un undoes the search interface. They make almost all their money from search ads. So, right. you know, they have a business that they need to you know, make sure stays profitable for the near term. So I would say there's not an immediate business risk in that respect, but yeah, the volatility is likely to continue as they experiment. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been looking at too. And I doubt they're going to like announce that there's been some sort of algorithm update. It's just going to be them tweaking things and publishers may be noticing some differences, but um, I don't think it's really anything to worry about. I just have seen a couple of different news articles on it and I'm sure publishers are kind of wondering what's going on. Yeah, and I and I I would just say like, as always, confirm that any changes that you see in on your site are actually search changes. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest mistake I see publishers make all the time is they attribute things to search uh, engine uh, like rankings that have nothing to do with the search engine, whether it's not even search engine traffic or they're not even going into Search Console and looking to see which queries and pages are seeing like discrepancies like period over period. And that's the best way to do it. Go into Search mm -hmm. Console, set a previous period and compare, um, and then just try to find you know the discrepancy between different uh, URLs or queries, and it usually will tell you everything you need to know. Sounds good. Um, so today, we have a couple of different um, topics. We have um, programmatic advertising um, as a quality problem. And Facebook is ending its news access in Canada, similar to what is um, what happened in Australia. And then Google potentially in hot water. It says billions at stake as YouTube ads found to violate terms of service. So there's only so much um, I'll be able to talk about with that, actually. I know. Yeah, I figured it was probably a topic that like we can only say so much. Um, well, but there's, I, the, yeah, I can only say so much because I don't want to get subpoenaed. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I did think um, that was interesting. And um, so we can kind of give our little take on it. So the first thing I have is an article from uh, Digital Content Next, I believe, DCN, right? That's what that stands for. Yeah, yeah, um, correct. So programmatic advertising has a quality problem. This article is a little bit more focused on advertisers, but it's revealed um, concerns among marketers about the quality of programmatic buying with approximately 15% of spending and 20% of impressions appearing on low quality made for advertising websites. So websites that are just made for advertisements on. Um, and that these websites account for a significant portion of impressions and information asymmetry and data access challenges hinder transparency and efficiency. And I kind of wanted to talk about um, more on the publisher side, what this quality problem, uh, I guess, how can it, it could affect publishers, how, how publish, publishers can ensure that they're using, um, you know, quality advertising um, partners. And um, yeah, just kind of on the, uh, this was, like I said, an advertising kind of focused article, but I kind of want to chalk on the publishing side, if you've kind of seen anything about, about the quality problem with programmatic advertising. Yeah, so... Um, I'll, I'll give two kind of perspectives on this. One, I would say, is the perspective of a publisher uh, on this topic, where as a publisher, broad, broadly industry-wide, this is where I feel like sort of your argument should be, and not even argument, just sort of like the stance that's in your best interest um, from, from my view personally. And that's that it's not a quality thing, because what the advertisers in the industry uh, intermediaries want to want to like kind of point the finger at publishers and say is like look it's because of the low quality websites that are only built to make money that's the reason why advertising is um like seeing uh declining quality and like why publishers aren't making as much money as they probably should because you have these poor quality guys out there that are uh like diluting the value of advertising and i would push back on that um, because it's not, there's an element of that that's not false. There's definitely, that definitely occurs. There's websites built to make money, but all sites are built to make money. To me, there's a clear distinguishing like factor between a 
a site that is built to make money but still provides like content, like quality content, or maybe it's not even, maybe it's commodity content, but like they still have it out there. They're welcome to make money from it. There's a difference between that and like arbitrage where it's like you're sort of like tricking the user into clicking on something to show ads on a site, which isn't really a profitable venture anymore. So I have a hard time kind of like believing that that's like 15 to 21% of impressions today. Irregardless, um, I would push back and say that advertising is not valued at what it should be because of ad inflation, which I've talked about on previous episodes. But advertising budgets go up every year. If you look at uh, the global GDP, it Mm -hmm. tracks perfectly with advertising. Global GDP rises because populations rise. Countries make more money, more people, more industry. So as that goes up, so do advertising budgets. Advertising works like we've known this since the beginning of time. And so advertising spending has been linear for, I mean, you probably could say like it's infinitely been linear uh, Mm -hmm. looking backwards and forwards. I guess backwards, we'd have to have a whole discussion about how time works. Um, We don't have time for that. We don't don't have time for that. How ironic. (laughs) Um, no, but the, the biggest thing with that is I would say that, um, because of that, we've never just allowed the value of advertising to increase. We've had the platforms and, uh, all the different, uh, advertising, uh, like, uh, big tech players like Google and stuff like that, where it's like they increase the supply as the demand Mm -hmm. rise. And what happens is you end up sort of like with this problem of there's only so much supply So what happens is is that the number of websites and amount of content that's out there actually isn't rising to the same degree at which sort of like the demand for advertising is available. So that just means that websites start showing more and more ads to account for these things or displaying more and that inflates the like the price. So now all of a sudden you've got or inflates the the cost in terms of or I guess you could think of it as deflation, but from a publisher standpoint, it makes it to where your advertising gets worth less and less because you've got 10 ads. The thing is, is like one ad would be better if it was effective and you'd get a higher quality sort of like advertiser, you'd get more attention engagement. And that's how some of these programmatic auctions are designed to work. And you can actually like make more from fewer ads if you if you know how to actually like wean your site off of ads. The problem is, is that every incentive and every motivated party that sits between you and the advertiser is trying to do the opposite of that. They're trying to get you mm-hmm. to like ad jam. And so with advertising, when I, when I hear things like this, the, the publisher perspective should always be like, we need to all be showing fewer ads. The advertisers need to be um, accepting of higher CPCs, higher CPMs, and just running campaigns where it's like, you're not buying on the impression um, like, or even just viewable impression. It's like it shouldn't be a matter of like trying to um, optimize for this like very small amount of money for a thousand of something whenever it's like the reason why you buy them by the thousands is for like a dollar is because they have so little value. It's like we mm-hmm. need to increase the value. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's not going to happen because um, advertisers, especially in big companies, you know, you've got CMOs with their incentives and paychecks tied to like. Uh, metrics like s- lower CPC costs and things like that until that changes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like I, I, I don't expect the industry to make that shift. Yeah, I, I don't either. Um, and if you're listening and you're like, I want to know more about ad rates and um, like what's going on this year, uh, we have an ongoing blog that I update every other week. So I updated it last week. So there won't be one this week, but next week. There'll be an update. Um, I think that the blog's just called Why Are Ad Rates So Low in 2023? And each week or every two weeks, I um, search through the news and look for ad rates um, and look at our own ad rates, our ad revenue index, and uh, just update you on what's going on with ad rates. So if you don't want to click through all the news articles, I will do it for you. <laughs> it's it's actually a really great. <laughs> uh, it's a great resource because I think you do a great job with that. Uh, with and and sort of breaking down in the context of like what's going on you mm-hmm. you filter in a lot of the elements of like this is why this works that way or this is how that works and um yeah i think it's a very approachable article so whether you're 
somebody that's listening to this and you want to know more about it and you don't know anything about um, like how the advertising ecosystem works, I would say it's very approachable and you'll probably learn something. And then mm -hmm. for those that are maybe experts, it's like, yeah, somebody did all the hard work of kind of putting things in context so you can see where, where and why things are trending the way they are. So it sounds like a plug, but it's just actually really good content. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I spend a decent amount of time on it every two weeks. So it's it's worth glancing over if you're kind of wondering what's going on with ad rates this year and with different ad tech businesses and such. Um, so this next uh, article that we have that we're going to talk about is that Facebook is ending its news access in Canada. And this, like I said, is similar to what happened in Australia. So meta yeah. platforms is planning to block access to news on Facebook and Instagram for all users in Canada once this online news act becomes law. Um, it was approved by the Senate in Canada and it would require internet giants to pay news publishers for their content. Um, so yeah, like I said, Australia did this um, between the tech, like, Australia was able to negotiate between the tech companies and Australian media, media companies resulting in agreements after amendments were made. So they're kind of in, Canada's kind of in this like amending situation where Google has yet to, I think, respond or it has responded revisions to the bill, but I don't know if Canada has looked over them yet. And so I wanted to talk about kind of this increasing, um, I guess, uh, event that's happening with different countries where they're saying, you know, you can't just take publishers news anymore and publish it, you know, on these on Facebook and on Instagram and not pay the publisher. And Google um, search so, in Australia, they tried to get yeah. that to go to. Oh, really? I didn't see that. Um, yeah, that, so was, what is, that was part of the, the argument against it, I think. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so I was interested in, so this is kind of uh, focused specifically on news publishers, but I was kind of interested in your take on, you know, this as not necessarily a trend, but like it's two countries now, two prominent countries that have kind of taken a stand against just publishers content being taken and um you know not really seeing any money for it um do you think that this is kind of like a something that's going to continue happening not necessarily even with countries but just like publishers having like getting stood up for a little bit as far as like their content being i know we're having trouble with this with ai as well you know plagiarism machines but yeah, um, yeah. i thought we could just have like a broader conversation about like taking content and publishers not getting paid, publishers getting paid, how do we navigate this? So this this type of legislation, I, I generally do think that uh, the intentions are that this is gonna like stick it to big tech, um, but it's a great example of like what we talked about last week with like GDPR and even regulating AI and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, this this has the opposite effect. So mm -hmm. what this does, and we this is, this is exactly what happened in Australia, where uh, Facebook said, well, we're just, we're not gonna do that. So we won't operate in Australia. The government caved and for all mm -hmm. the reasons why this type of legislation doesn't work. So like, imagine this, uh, government rules that you cannot show uh, content without paying news publishers to show it, whether it's in the Google search carousel or it's in a Facebook news feed. So you have to compensate a news publisher if you display their content in your, in your uh, platform. Now, all of a sudden you go as a news publisher of any kind, you go, okay, well, great. Like now Facebook has to pay me. And Facebook says, well, I'm only going to pay you a very, very tiny amount of money and that's it. And to do that, like maybe they don't allow you to show advertising on your website because that's one of their preconditions. You go, no way, I'm going to make way less money. And then they go, cool, ignore and then they go yeah. to somebody else. And eventually they will find, because news is a commodity. It's the most, mm -hmm. it's why ad rates are always lowest in news because it's this mm -hmm. very broad, like if you want to do an advertisement that hits literally everybody in a demographic, like broadly, it's like news. So the ad rates are the lowest because it's like massive demand while also like infinite supply. And so what happens is, is you've got this commodity product that you've now given big tech the ability to shake down and sort of like race to the bottom on the price. And you also allow them to set preconditions too, to where it's like right now you own your website, like big tech can't tell you how to run it or how to monetize it. Um, they can set policies and guidelines, but for the most part, you know, like you operate that with, you know, zero oversight, 
Well, now all of a sudden you've been you've been put into a situation where you have to do a hostile negotiation and that doesn't work out for you. And it does for big tech who can who can basically say, we'll take our ball and go home. And that takes tax revenue. It takes jobs. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's devastating. So it's like you give them this strong negotiation position by by implementing this. So I don't think it's going to work. I think what will happen in Australia will happen in Canada and they will find some way to extract like a fine from big tech from it. Because I think that that's sort of like the goal here is to either generate revenue within the country um, in the form of like those tech companies having to pay it back to, uh, you know, in the binds of, you know, the the state's um like jurisdiction, actual mm -hmm. revenue that goes to businesses, uh, or they just want to like basically tax them a little bit more. And uh, they usually find ways to do that, but hopefully it doesn't come with all these, you know, negative downsides for publishers. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was kind of thinking about this and it's, you know, a bit like um, governments and big tech specifically, um, you know, like uh Facebook in this regard, um, playing chicken with one another, like who's going to cave first. <laughs> and it always ends up being the government because what are you just like going to shut down like Facebook in like Australia and Canada? Like it's not going to happen. Um, because the, the thing is, there's always going to be an alternative and in the mm -hmm. current environment, it's going to be another platform. So like even in countries like China, where you don't have something like Twitter available because it's blocked by the, you know, the great, the great internet wall of China. Um, mm -hmm. they, they have like uh, Weibo or Weibo, I think is, mm -hmm. is what it's called. And so you're going to always have these platforms that sort of like dominate a certain type of uh, discussion or certain format. And, mm -hmm. um, and right now doing something that like forces them to um, like run or operate their business in one specific way. I mean, this is not the way that best benefits publishers, right? Right. Like, yeah. Like how many publishers want to basically have to negotiate a deal with Google just to show up in search results? I bet none of our listeners would would love that because no. there's a good chance that you just get left out in general. Like, you know what I mean? And I think that that's mm -hmm. bad for consumers as well because you have fewer options, fewer choices, um, and you could argue that it's a form of censorship as well in that regard, mm -hmm. or gives the power of censorship to a private business. Yeah, yeah, just. Thinking about this, I was just, um, I being in my hometown, thinking of, you know, growing up and when Facebook emerged on the scene, I don't think I ever, if you would have asked someone in like 2007, if, you know, Facebook would have, uh, I guess, authority against like a government to, and like when <laughs> yeah, basically funny, right? just to stay prevalent, like in the, like, if you know, if this happened in 2007, just like, oh, Australia is not going to allow Facebook, like, okay. <laughs> like nobody yeah, cares well, but like I mean, the way that they've grown is just like insane well these platforms have considerable power from that regard and i think you know in in some ways they've been um they've been really uh helpful for uh both democracy and free speech and different things like that um but one of the areas that i think uh we have to be wary of and i think we've been victims to it as consumers to a certain extent is uh, the technocratic power that they have to be able to sort of dictate not just the laws, but like uh, sort of like the rules of society in some ways by by really dominating the di uh, discourse and also being able to sort of like manipulate and shape the way that, you know, like countries or entire groups of people um, interact with each other and, and under what circumstances. And I think moving forward with AI, uh, there's a really good chance that we become so reliant on some of the systems and processes um, that AI is sort of like governing and, and watch guarding for us that, you know, if it's a private business that is sort of like the one behind the wheel of something like that, you know, we run the risk of, you know, destabilizing our sort of like uh, public governments and in exchange for almost these like techno dictatorships um, with AI. And I, I that's, you know, that's probably pretty far down the line, but that is something that mm -hmm. uh, I think people are sounding the alarm bells about already. Yeah, I've seen a lot of um, articles regarding that. Oh, hi there. My name's Connor Porter, and I'm a technical support specialist here at Azoic. Sorry about that. I was looking for the latest product releases from Azoic. 
The correct place is thelatest.azoic.com. Now, thelatest.azoic.com is where you can find the latest product releases, feature updates, and give you the know-how to give you the competitive edge in an ever-changing market. Uncover the newest advantages across all Azoic products and make sure your site is meeting its potential, full potential, with our resources and insights. Check out the latest.azoic today. Um, well, our last topic is, um, like we said, we can only speak so much on it, but um, Google apparently has billions at stake because YouTube ads have been found to violate terms of service. So I've never even heard of Adalytics. It's an ad analytics uh, website, in case you didn't catch that. Um, they show that approximately 80% of the ads served by YouTube across the web have breached its own terms of service. Um, and that advertisers pay YouTube to display their ads, but it was found that half of those ads are not actually shown on YouTube. They're shown through third-party sites, which these ads are often muted, auto-playing off of the side, unable to be skipped. Um, and that's not what the advertiser signed up for. So um, you allegedly, know, pay more. I'm just yeah. This, this is all allegedly. Yeah, um, this is all allegedly. Um, so this is uh, so Google refutes the claims made by Adalytics stating that the report used unreliable sampling and proxy methodologies um, and that the majority of video ad campaigns run on YouTube, not the Google Video Partners Network, which is what um, they are saying they played on. So um, what what have you heard about this? Um, what do you think is going to happen from it? I'm This is the only article I found on this, but I was like, if it's true, like, that's a big deal, but like, I guess what, what is your take on it? What have you heard about it? So, so I, I am s somewhat limited in what I can talk about this because there yeah. are certain things that, um, there's details of, of this sort of like case that number one, uh, I don't want to have to, um, get in front of, uh, a court or anyone and have to explain right. things that, you know, like, Theoretically, I could be aware of or, or, or know or privy to conversations. But one of the things that I w would say theoretically um, in this alleged case uh, is that the analytics claims and sort of like the overall uh, point of this entire, um, this, this um, I, I guess, basically like this controversy that they're in. I, I'll say controversy just because it, it's something that, like, I'm surprised that charges are just now being brought because this is something that um, Adalix is not the first one to notice that Google mm. gives preferential treatment in their ad auctions to their own inventory, mm -hmm. allegedly. So mm -hmm. if this is something that has been known to industry players for a while and mm -hmm. something where maybe uh, various parties have already sounded the alarm both to Google and to authorities about, um, it's taken a long time for them to take action. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's probably indicative of the fact that something will come of it. Um, I've heard is, is, I mean, like the UK had talked very seriously about breaking apart Google's ad business. And mm -hmm. this seems to me like the type of thing that would justify that in the US. So um, it definitely looks like there's more smoke in that direction. Um, and I could see them, yeah, uh, like forcing that sort of antitrust action on Google because mm -hmm. it it is quite it is quite interesting that the the amount of hubris that you would have to have if you were to be a, fully aware of this this sort of like thing that's going mm -hmm. on and um, it would speak to me as it seems to be on purpose or at least by design intentional or not because it is being pointed out maybe over the course of years by multiple partners. I will say it is somewhat validating though, because um, I know for a fact that uh, at, at our company, we've very specifically not done many of the things that other parties and partners were willing to do um, mm -hmm. to take advantage of something like this. And despite that, uh, many others were very happy to like break Google's own policy on showing things like, you know, videos that just play ads on loop and there's no mm -hmm. actual content in the video as a hovering video player and things like that. And that's bad for publishers and advertisers long term and we've refused to do it. 
And um, yeah, it's it's validating to see um, this actual action be be taking on something like this because it goes back to the first conversation we had today about like advertising does have value and it's mm -hmm. it's it's these parties that sit in the in between that manipulate the supply and demand to their benefit uh, that takes away a lot of the value that publishers and advertisers should be extracting. Advertisers should be able to reach their audience as they imagine um, in a fair way without having to just accept a certain amount of waste. And publishers should be paid a fair price for, you know, whatever amount of inventory ad space that they have. Um, and they should be able to sell an advertiser like a fair value for that without having to jam in like six ads as opposed to one just because that's the manipulated sort of like cost because of all the intermediaries that sit in between them. Yeah, you said that this has been brought up before. What kind of happened? I don't remember. Maybe this was, you know, when, when I first I, I, I don't mean publicly. Industry. Oh, I it's not in public. Okay. No one's allegedly, done this. If, yeah. if there were to be parties within the ecosystem that were to maybe go to Google and others and say, hey, oh, okay. this is something that we noticed and no action was taken, then, yeah, I would imagine that that would look bad and would be indicative of something that's obviously intentional. Yeah, I think that this will be something to keep an eye on, um, just bringing it to our attention now, um, you know, to kind of see where the story goes, maybe. It, maybe it, it's wrong in analytics. I've never, it, I feel like it's a big claim from a company I've never heard of before. So. Yeah, yeah, well, it's definitely not just them. And, um, you know, I have very close ties with folks at Google and obviously still mm -hmm. a close partner with them. And yeah, I would say that, um, you know, I would welcome them both privately and publicly if members of the organization listen to the show. Um, <laughs> I'd more than welcome you to come on the show and, and correct us where we're maybe wrong or maybe um, unfairly positioning part of this. Um, but yeah, I, I may or may not have had conversations with various parties in the mix of this outside of our podcast. And hmm. yeah, I, I would, I would, I guess that I'm not missing a lot here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear from Google. Um, if Google, someone listens from Google just happens to be listening to our podcast. Um, I kind of hope time. not, but yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's what we have for the day. Did you have anything else on the topics we talked about or anything you saw in the news that was worth mentioning? No, not really. I think, you know, the Google story at the end was something that was um, it, I've been following really closely. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say we did have a comment from a reader that said since we've changed the format, they haven't been able to see what shoes I'm wearing. So these are oh no, these are the Air Maxes <laughs> that I wore today. So uh -huh. whoever put that comment out there, there, you can check that out. At <laughs> Mark, whatever this is in the uh, in the video. Someone's but, very yeah. concerned about the shoes you have on. It, you know what, whoever it is, I appreciate your your attention to detail and also yeah, appreciate really. sort of like the recognition. I'm, I'm glad the shoe game that I have uh, for much of my life, I could only afford to buy one pair of shoes and I'd wear them for like a year uh, mm -hmm. before I ever changed them out or wore them out. And um, yeah, after I, I sold my first startup, I was like, you know what, I can afford to have more than one pair of shoes. So now I, uh, I have a lot and they're mostly Nikes. So if you're a, if you're a shoe connoisseur like myself, um, yeah, I'll try to keep it mixed up on the podcast. So Keep you guessing. Yeah, stay tuned to see next <laughs> week what shoe Tyler's wearing. Yeah, um, well, I feel like we'll attract like a said, different audience for sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a weird um, one. I don't know. Maybe maybe there's a weird cross section of like Nike lovers and publishers that are really just gonna flock to this podcast. Yeah, maybe if if that's if that's you, let us know. I'd be really interested to know if that's the case. <laughs> I'd be surprised if it was, but. Uh, well, like we've said before, you can leave comments on YouTube, you can go to publisherlab.org and leave us a comment, a question or concern, something you want us to talk about. Um, you can watch this podcast on our YouTube channel. You can listen to it on wherever you find podcasts. We'd love any ratings that you'd like to give us a thumbs up, you know, Apple podcast rating, Spotify rating. Um, and I look forward to I guess being here again next week, uh, 4th of July next week. I believe we're still releasing a podcast episode. So we will see you next Thursday. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Publisher Lab.